Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next session in the Cool and Gatta Room. I'd just like to introduce Gavin Brown for the ransomware crisis simulation with you in control. All yours. Thanks. Yes, hi, I'm Gavin Brown from Cyberbit. I won't introduce myself too much, it's all been done. Uh, we're going to be using a product called Slido today. If you want to interact and actually take part in today's discussion, uh, all you have to do is go to slido.com or open the Slido app if you've got it and enter that game pin. Uh, you'll then later on get a series of questions that you'll need to answer. So I'll start um, while I let you just do that. So, clicker. So I'm going to take you through a crisis simulation based on one of the most common uh, and, and forms of malware, the ransomware attack, which as you can see from this slide is very expensive and is projected to get become a very expensive attack to face in the future. One of the biggest challenges in incident response is not the technical use of the tool, the communication between the technical team and the management team. The ability to practice this is a real game changer in the ability to understand the gaps in the process and then work through the problems that are discovered. Now, we're not ready for ransomware. A lot of companies aren't. Ransomware readiness is now a board level directive in most organisations in Australia. However, organisations aren't prepared and don't know how they will respond when it actually occurs, even though they know or should know it will occur. Organisations haven't set up their playbooks. The SOC team hasn't practised how they will respond to the situation and the board hasn't rehearsed their decision making processes. And today what we're going to be using is a CyberBit platform for the simulation. This is a uh, full cyber attack response simulation platform or ready readiness preparation platform. It includes four components, uh, four main components. We assess your team's performance. So this is about making sure that your team is ready to face an attack. Um, so all their exercises are assessed so that uh, there are dashboards that enable you to really assess how your team performed it. That are also consistent with the MITRE attack framework and the NICE framework as well. We have labs, sorry, I've just gone forward too far, that boost individual skills. So these are hands-on exercises in miniature networks that are mostly based around miniature scenarios or little, little mini scenarios that you can face that boost your individual skills in all the foundational tools that are required and skills that are required to actually resolve incidents as they occur. Thirdly, the live fire exercise, which is the cornerstone of the CyberBit platform, which is what you're gonna be seeing a little bit of today. This is where we uh, give uh, trainees the ability to actually face a real attack, reverse engineered malware of course, in a real network, not a simulated network, but a real network with real corporate tools. In that exercise, what will happen typically is that they will go into the, to, um, their network, they'll open up the tools, they will typically open up at the start of the day when they start working on their, in their SOC, and they would see an alert. And their job is to do two things, to find out as much as they can about the alert, to find out if it's a genuine issue, to find out where, if there is malware, where it's come from, whether there's any lateral movement, whether there's any signs of persistence, command and control communications, and so on. They've got to record that information, and then they've actually got to mitigate the attack. And well, by mitigate, I mean not just say, I'm going to do this, but actually mitigate the attack to get the results in the scenario. So these scenarios do three things. They boost teamwork skills, as you can see, uh, teams, people need to work together in these exercises to resolve the threat. That's realistic. Uh, for the same reason, uh, our exercises, I should say, are unguided. Uh, and that's also realistic because when an attack comes, you don't get a little, little bullet point thing that just says, now you've done that, go here, go there. It's completely unguided because that's realistic. Uh, the second thing it teaches is intuition. We, through our platform, want people to be able to understand instinctively where to go next. And you can only do that by practice. You can't teach that sort of thing. So we want them to be able to recognise, ah, oh, I've just seen this, that means I have to go here. And, and be able to just instinctively know where to go. And after many, many exercises, that's what happens. And the third thing is experience. So giving people a sense of experience so they feel like they've done it before and therefore they know uh, how to handle a situation without unnecessary stress. Now the fourth part of the platform is the crisis, cyber crisis simulation, and that's what we're gonna be looking at today in this exercise. Uh, this isn't just a tabletop exercise. What we've done here is we've combined the technical with the uh, management, as this is also how real incidents occur. The management team waits on the technical team to investigate the attack, to find out as much as they can about it, and to escalate key, key uh, findings to them. And then the technical team relies on the management team to advise them on how to respond to the threat. So I want you to meet Tony now. Tony is a tier one analyst in our incident response team, and he's conducting initial incident investigation into an incident alert. 
He's going to escalate the findings to you and you will play the role of the executive team and you'll vote together on decide, deciding on the next steps. So I'm just going to take a few seconds to check how you're all going with Slido. Any issues there? Oh, the code? Yes, uh, the code is here. 23890019. You'll still have another minute before you have to answer a question, so don't worry about that. Now, I'm Tony. We're we going to switch now to the uh, computer. Is that code okay now? Okay, sorry, code back again. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. One thing I didn't plan for this. Should have had somewhere to put the code elsewhere. Yeah. Every slide. Yeah, every slide, yeah. Except the next page isn't a slide, it's my computer. Okay, so <laughs> we can switch now. So this is a Cyberbit platform, and I'm Tony. So I'm, I'm acting as the SOC team here. So Tony is practicing uh, in a scenario, and he's actually received a report of a situation. Now, this report says the following. This is what I'm going to focus on because this is a specific information about this specific scenario that Tony's facing. User 67 has called to report his machine is acting strange. The user has received a note claiming to have encrypted all files on their machine with a demand for payment to decrypt the files. So, a bit of a concern. Let me just show you what Tony has at his disposal to resolve through, solve the situation. He has a network map. This is his network here. This is, as I mentioned, that real network. Uh, he has an internal firewall there and a DMZ firewall. It's typically segmented just like a real network is. He's going to be working through a VPN segment here and the students, uh, or sorry, the uh, virtual workstation that has been attacked is in that user segment just to the left here. Um, this is just a typical corporate network. Of course, there are other networks such as Azure and uh, AWS networks, even OT networks as well. So he has a network info which indicates how he's going to connect to all the servers, but you don't need to see that because I've already pre-connected, so that's all nice and simple. This is his mission, Tony's requirements. Let me go back into that, just do an F5. Okay. So Tony has to add, enter information about the attack, as I mentioned before, that's adding new findings. And as you can see, he's already entered one thing, excuse my small screen, he's entered that he's discovered command and control communication. And he has to also remediate the attack. And you can see he's already done one of these things here by deleting the malicious payload, payload I should say, that was downloaded to the, to the um, virtual desktop. So that's his mission and his requirements. But given the information we have so far, the first thing we should do is check this workstation. So we go into our virtual workstation, and or what we call it the simulator station, and this is the ransom note. Now this ransom note doesn't actually require specific ransom. I'm struggling to scroll through that, but ooh, yes, there it is. I'll close that down, but it didn't ask for a specific ransom. It just said to uh, contact the hackers. Now we'll look at Tony's computer, and you can see he's not a very good file, not a very good at storing his files. But you can see that his, uh, his files on his desktop have been encrypted. I'm struggling to get the name of the file, but you can see Epsilon Red is the extension there. I'll open up the source code folder and just check that his source code is okay, and that's also been encrypted with Epsilon Red. So it looks like a genuine attack at this stage. So let's escalate this to the executive team. I'm going to put this down. Okay. So looks like all files and some programs have been encrypted on one workstation. The ransom note has also been received. And we'll make that high priority and we'll send a note across. This is concerning, obviously. Hmm. Okay, so that was reported. Now I'm going to go to the executive team. And you can see already, yeah, a little pop-up has occurred that says organizational, organizational health metrics were affected. Our data integrity has gone down. Now this is the management team who can actually see what's going on in the SOC room here, but they also have the executive room here. And they've been given some information. In this crisis simulation exercise, the board of a global organization faces a severe cyber threat. 
SOC team is going to deal with the investigation, I'll summarise that, but as a crisis management team, you'll be required to assess and address the strategic challenges associated with the breach and make critical decisions about how to handle this crisis. So, let's go to the discussion questions. Now you'll notice already that question one and question two have just been unlocked. Now they were unlocked because that information was sent to us. So we're going to start discussing these questions, but firstly just a couple of points. Okay, some of these questions are going to vary. Some of these questions are a question of deciding a prioritisation. There's a few actions you might want to do, but you might have to just choose one of them as a priority. In some cases, there might be no actions you want to do. You just have to choose the worst, or the least worst of all the options. And in some cases, it'll be a matter of uh, understanding risk and analysis as well. So there's a variety of questions we'll get asked. But let's get to the first one here. The technical team has informed you that the encrypted data includes employees' personal information and customers' bank account details. Which stakeholders do you need to communicate with as an immediate priority? The options are, don't communicate yet. Oh, sorry, this is question two. I've jumped. Okay, as a crisis, I won't read that next time. As a crisis management team at ACME, you've been mobilized following what appears to be a severe cyber attack. The SOC manager has informed you that various files and programs have been encrypted and a ransom demand has been received. Meanwhile, the front desk is experiencing an unprecedented volume of calls from news agencies as an employee has leaked information about the situation. What would be your immediate response priorities? So we've got four choices. To focus on containment of the incident. Any communications can wait till you have more information. First communication strategy is here's the plan. So let's pe let people know the, the plan. A cyber attack has occurred and we are working to restore our network and services as quickly as possible. Contact us on this number for further information. Option two is apology. We apologize for any inconvenience caused and we'll learn lessons going forward. We'll keep you updated in due course. And lastly, defer. We are carrying out some unexpected upgrades to our IT system. We expect to return to normal levels of service in due course. We'll keep you updated on progress once we know an expected time of completion of the work. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that open. I won't mention any key considerations. We're running low on time. So Brendan's gonna open this up for you to vote. Good afternoon everyone, Brendan Newell from Cyber Pathways. Uh, Cyber Pathways is the Australian distributor of Cyberbit and my job today is to manage the Slido program for you. So the poll's open, question number one is open. If you go and put in your answers there, what I'm going to do is convey to Gavin what people are saying and then we're going to put the answer into the Cyberbit platform as we would do if we were actually participating in this activity as a C-suite management team we would respond and put the answer in there. So this would usually follow some sort of discussion. So I can see now people are putting their answers into the poll and we're getting an interesting distribution on what the response should be. We'll give you a couple of minutes just to get those answers in. Actually, we won't give you a couple of minutes, a couple Probably of seconds. Probably not that long, yeah. yeah. And um, as we Quick do decision each, making is a key in these situations. <laughs> as we do each of these questions, we might come around the floor too and see if anyone's got some comments or follow-ups on uh, particular questions because there's often some interesting dis discussion topics. All right, Gavin, I can give you an update. I can see okay. that 52% of people are actually saying to us, focus on containment. And okay. then we've got an interesting distribution of 35% on communication strategy one, 10% on number two and 3% on number three. So I think we've got an interesting distribution of 52% okay. of people saying, let's contain this. And then we've got a spread across the communication strategies on what people are saying in terms of communicating. So okay. one of the things that we're doing with this very quickly is, does anyone have any comments here? Because we've got a bit of a 50-50 split. Communicate, focus on containment. Anyone want to tell us why they would focus on one or the other? Put your hand up, I could walk around. Might be not a great idea, especially because there's a contact number, and I think it's going to um, increase even more the, the load on the organization. So um, probably I would select another communication strategy. Yeah, really good tip. That's a really good bit of feedback. So the communication strategy number one has a phone number. Might overload the team in terms of flooding them with more information. So that's a good bit of feedback. The team also has to know what they're going to respond, and you've got to plan that. Hmm. Exactly. So we've got an interesting spread here, Gavin, for you to enter yeah. into the system okay. to see what the right answer well, is. Well, I'm going to enter the vote. The, the, the vote. It's a democratic society here in this. 52% yeah. of people say focus on containment. Okay. So, so we're going to submit one. that. Now, what's happening at the top, you'll notice our business health metrics. We've got business continuity, reputation and data integrity. Now, our um, data integrity has already gone down because of the fact that uh, uh, we've been breached. But if I submit this answer, you can see that the data integrity has um, gone down a little bit more. 
and we've also had a bit of a hit to our, uh, no, data integrity has stayed stable, but we've had a bit of a hit to our business continuity, look, no, to our reputation there, probably because we haven't communicated. So now these are all uh, configurable. So you can create your own scenarios with this product and actually change the way the answers affect the business metrics. Um, it's your decision when you, uh, when company, you set this up for your executive team, how those decisions will affect their business metrics and what the business metrics will be. But let's go to question two. I read this out before. The technical team has informed us that the data includes employees' personal information and their customers' bank account details. So which stakeholders do we need to communicate with as an immediate priority? Don't communicate yet, you need more information first. So more get, once again, don't communicate yet. Then the data subjects, as in the people whose data was breached, the appropriate regulators, the shareholders, or the press. Now, if we we're members of Acme Incorporated, we would normally discuss and consider our crisis communications plan and all of our legal requirements, but we're not, we don't know that. So we're just gonna have to go with some general, a general understanding of what we might do. Okay, Brendan. The voting is open, Gavin. People are entering their results. So quickly put in your response for, those, for that question. Obviously, there's lots of discussion points that can come out of the different responses. What was interesting for people's response for this one, uh, we had early responses for contact the regulator immediately, and now we're getting a bit more of a balance between people saying, don't communicate yet because you need some more information. I guess one of the follow-on questions that we had for this particular element was, is there a risk of communicating to a regulator too early? We all like the risk word. Anyone suggest, is there a risk that we go and communicate to a regulator too early? Yeah? I think so, because you may provide inaccurate information and invite unwanted scrutiny and have to get follow-up things when you should be eradicating or controlling things that's, yeah. Yeah, great response. So we don't want to go too early and maybe provide false information. So I think that's a great response. Well, what's too early unless, what's the time like? Exactly. What is the time? That's another yeah, good question, yeah. isn't it? So what are, what are some of the metrics that usually give us a timeline? There's legislation in place that tells us we have to report within a certain framework often, right? Anything else? I meant the timeline for this simulation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Now, we've created this simulation. We can just change it, obviously, and put a timeline in. But uh, I haven't done that when I set this up, unfortunately. But this is pretty quick. This is all happening very quickly in, the, in a space of a few hours. Do we know if the data is inaccurate? Yeah, good question. Not at, not at this yeah. stage. We don't know that. No. Yeah. So lots of unknowns. We might close this one out. Question uh, number two, Gavin. So we've okay. got the, the majority is saying 61% of people are saying contact the appropriate regulator. So that's the okay. answer that... So that I think is gonna have a bit of a hit on our business, uh, to business continuity, but it might be good for our reputation, we'll just see. Yes, our business continuity has gone down, but it hasn't had much effect on our reputation or our data integrity. Okay. So before we go to the next question, we can't because it's locked. So I'm gonna go back to uh, Tony. Tony's just escalated one event, and now he's doing a bit more investigation, okay? So I'm going to show you what he's been doing. Let's close down this workstation. We don't want to look at that and have the memory of it in our minds. So he's done a bit of investigation in Palo Alto. And you can see this is the affected workstation, 192.168.112. And he's just looking for any communication from that attacker to, from that, sorry, that infected workstation to anyone else not within our network. And it seems to be one destination standing out. You can see the IP address there. And you can see quite a lot of FTP traffic as well over 8080 and 443. So that's a bit of a concern. It looks like there's some data that might be being exfiltrated here. Now, if we look in Splunk, here's a search I've created <laughs> ahead of time. Well, that's not much good. And writing out that search is going to take me a while. So that was a search I had in place that uh, unless I log in and it just, well, I can't imagine. There's a small chance it's gonna be in my memory. There it is, it's there. Okay, so here's my search that I built earlier, uh, just to see all the traffic, uh, wh what servers are communicating with the attacker that I discovered in Palo Alto. That's the next thing I did at this point in time. And I can see that there's four workstations communicating with that server, uh, with it by FTP, and you can see the count is quite enormous. So it's a lot of traffic going out to that machine, to that attacker. 
And then we've got carbon black as well that we're looking at in this exercise and we can see the uh, red dot exe, uh, the epsilon payload process that's actually running as well and we can investigate that. We can obviously scroll down and get a lot more information about what that's doing and the processes it, or what, what's it, what it's actually doing internally. So that's a bit more investigation that we've done. And we've discovered that yes, the data has been exfiltrated, but also from a number of workstations. So let's escalate that as well. Three additional workstations have been identified on which all data has been both data encrypted and exfiltrated. Obviously we had to do a bit more research, open up those machines, check that the data was encrypted as well, but we've done that. Now this is getting pretty critical. We could possibly assume, uh, you know, just say, we've only investigated one subnet. Oh, I lie because I included the whole network, but let's just say that. Now I've just reported that and I go back to the executive team and you can see I've already Im immediately got an indication that that escalation event, three additional workspaces was, um, was in, uh, escalated to us. Question three has been unlocked and the organizational health metrics were now impacted quite a lot because our data integrity has gone way down because obviously, you know, possibly all of our workstations have been, ex had been um, encrypted, all our critical data. So we've got another question to discuss. The technical team has informed you that the encrypted data includes, oh, no, question three. Thought that was familiar. The SOC has now confirmed that the data has also been exfiltrated. Several workstations are also compromised and we can assume lateral movement across all of our workstations. I'm summarizing due to lack of time. Additionally, it has been confirmed that all backups have also been successfully encrypted or unsuccessfully from our point of view. Multiple internal and customer facing business services are now experiencing severe delays and in some cases have ground to a complete halt. The situation is critical. How will you respond? Okay, so options. Continue to explore manual and other workarounds in order to sustain critical services. Pay the ransom demand, now established to be $1.5 million in Bitcoin. So obviously by this point, someone has also communicated with the ransom, with the attackers as well. Inform the hackers you refuse to pay the ransom demand. Initiate dialogue with the hackers and attempt to negotiate. Or make an insurance claim and hope that they are willing to pay the demand. So this is really a big question where we've got to discuss, do we pay the ransom? A couple of notes here. Of all companies who've paid the ransom, on average, they get about 61% of their data back. That's general average. And only 4% actually get all their data back. So paying the ransom doesn't guarantee that you're going to get your data back and you're generally very unlikely to get it all back. So a few questions to consider here is, well, if we don't pay the ransom, can we work around the situation? Do we actually have a plan, a business continuity policy to sustain our critical, business critical services in situations like that? And have we defined in advance what our business critical services are? That's really important to do. How much time will it take to resolve this and how much time can our company sustain our services while this is going on? Do we know what the cost per day is? And of course the insurance question, do we know what our insurance policy is? Have we got that and, and are we ready to understand, we should understand beforehand? what that is before we can answer this question. So I'm going to hand that over to Brendan. Thank you, Gavin. The poll is open and the votes are flooding in already, so that's good to see. Um, a little side note here. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Cyberbit platform, that's really good that you can see Gavin flipping between the two different views there. So if you're the C-suite where you're concerned with questions around business continuity, reputation and data integrity, this is the interface that you'd have, imagining your tech team is doing the activity. So think about taking your desktop activity into a live environment where you're actually responding to things that are happening and as you can see from what Gavin showed before, your tech team has access to the enterprise software. So you could be using Splunk, Palo Alto, Carbon Black, whatever they're using, and escalating those messages through. So a really, really powerful platform. Um, the votes look like they're in. It, yeah. Votes are in, Gavin, and 100% of people have said pay the ransom. Oh, okay. That's not true. That's oh. not true. <laughs> so what are some of the risks around <laughs> paying the ransom aside from losing money? Are there, are there non-monetary risks? Sanctions. Yep, sanctions. It's a crime, yeah. So it's being made illegal in a lot of places. Anyone else? Not quite yet in Australia, but it probably will happen. Yeah. It could be legal if it's some sort of issue on fund terrorism. Yeah. Good response. So if it was mm. to fund terrorism, then it could be deemed illegal payments. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So mm. lots of interesting questions there. And what we're seeing actually on the poll is 81% of people have said continue to explore manual and other workarounds. In fact, no one said pay the ransom, which is <laughs> okay. interesting. Well, there you go. I'm going to submit that. Okay. We've stabilized in most respects and our business continuity has has gone oh sorry i've just clicked the button by mistake sorry about that 
Okay, so we're going to go to question five now. The hackers have lost patience and decided to up the ante. Several customers are now reporting being contacted directly and threatened by the hackers. Word of this is spreading like wildfire on social media. And there's an attachment there. Twitter, being contacted by a hacker group, claiming they've got my data, an successful attack against company Acme. No idea how they obtained my phone number. Security is stuck in the dark ages. Get out while you can. So not a very sticky company. Ask me. Okay, so how would you respond to this latest escalation? Now, this is a free text question where we discuss and get a bit of an answer on what we're going to think. Uh, so this is a little bit dif different question where typically, oh, sorry, it's locked for all other team members. Yes, I can't answer that. Um, please enter your answer. So basically, this is where we discuss this. Uh, we enter an answer and uh, a consultant will typically then vote or determine how that affects your business metrics. So anybody got any ideas? I'm looking for you guys to suggest things. This time you can't vote, so. Anyone want to offer a comment? I mean, should be speaking to your legal team, your PR team, and probably your insurance as well. Hmm. So we get input from everybody. Yeah. Probably going to bring in all those people. But no one, no one in question three suggested um, going to the insurance company. I did. Oh, you did? So there was some. Okay, it wasn't 100%. Okay. No, make it yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, like, go and contact yeah. them, because then they would bring in forensics and... Yeah, yeah. Obvious. Most policies, too, won't actually... They don't pay rain for ransomware, they reimburse them. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Mm. One of the great so things... that wasn't a good, well-worded question yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gavin, one of the great things I like about the system is you can see the conversations that it initiates within a C-suite, which is exactly what you want to see happening. So, great way to practice that in a live scenario. So I'm going to just write, you can see I've got one option to answer that question myself because I've clicked into it, but I'm just going to say contact a few people because we're lacking time. So I'm going to keep it really simple, okay? And I'm going to submit that. Now this is a team submitting that and I'm the, I'm the um, consultant who's performing the exercise and helping with this and I'm going to say, well, that answer really didn't do much, but you know, just for the sake of a graph, I'm going to say it was actually pretty good for our business continuity and our reputation. Uh, but our data integrity went down because we did that. Just randomly select some options there just to show you how that can be done. Now, I'm going to move to the last question because we're really running low on time. So, we now move to question eight. And that's been unlocked by Brendan, who's just escalated the, the other activity, the other information. So, if I go to the timeline, I can see that Brendan escalated just recently that Workstation 67, the first one hit, was infected because a malicious file was downloaded from Firefox. Okay, so now this is a, we've got a little bit of time to actually discuss this, but uh, it's going to be a difficult decision for most of you on a Friday afternoon. Three days have passed and the threat has been mitigated. Most data has been recovered using slightly older backups. You are now also aware that the attack was launched via a malicious file download. You now consider, need to consider what your priorities are, should be, in your post-incident analysis. However, the end of your skiing trip is coming up and you're all due to leave in an hour. So should you go or do the analysis and prioritise one of the following? Well, I didn't expect to have time for this. We do have a bit of time, so I'll let you vote if you want to go and have fun or do some post-incident analysis and which, what you would prioritise. Votes are coming in, Gavin. Way too many people are voting, go have fun. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'm going to vote go and have fun. We need a bit of time for questions. Yeah. Well, if we were. So I'm going to click Probably go would. and have fun here. It, even though 50, 46% of people did actually say reinforce the All protective right. security what, tools. What, so. what, what's go and have fun then? 25%. All right. We're going to reinforce. What are we reinforcing? Our protect reinforce protective security protective tools. Protective security tools. Good Correct. thinking. Okay. Well, you saved the day by not saying go on the skiing trip. Okay, so if we can switch to the uh, slides now, that would be great. Okay, and the clicker. So before we go to any questions and answers, I just wanted to make a few things. So we know ransomware will happen. So what's, we know the risk, we know it's likely to happen. And we're not really minimizing the risk. We minimize, well, we're minimizing the risk, but primarily the most the best thing we can do is minimize the impact as well. Uh, in relation to this. Obviously, there's a lot of things we can do to minimise risk, but 
that's not really the scope of this discussion. This is about the impact and the incident response scenario and how we deal with the crisis when it occurs, if it occurs. The first thing to do is backup. And the key thing about backups is not keeping them online, having them offsite. It's really obvious, but uh, surprising how many people don't actually do that and how many organizations don't do that. Uh, the second thing is to prepare your incident response plan. So that's there. Uh, make sure that everybody knows their role. That's really important as well. So the SOC team and the executive team maintain the distinct roles. Knowing how to communicate with each other is really important and practicing that is really important. And that's the third thing. So running exercises continuously. Um, tabletops for managers and cyber range, live fire exercises for your, the uh, incident response team and making those ex exercises realistic is the important thing to do. So communication, making them teamwork based exercises and making them as realistic as possible. So uh, I'm opening up to questions now. The, well, the crisis simulation is specifically for executive team, non-technical staff. But teachers, in what's, what sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that preventative education is available in a lot simpler platforms. And, you know, what we provide is probably a more advanced platform that's a little bit probably too advanced for a, a school or... or Having said person. that, yeah. I can tell Gavin that we in Australia have a lot of schools that are actually interested in the platform yeah. because that's often the perception, but mm. there's a lot of school-aged students who are very technically savvy, as we would all know, and so there's a number of schools talking to us at the moment asking, can we build that? They were often called a cyber lab or a cyber range with on their premise, and we're actually working with a lot of them to get the cyber bit platform in. So, so interesting question, actually. I really suppose you're right, Grant. What I was thinking of is just that the basic dealing with phishing, that sort of thing, and, and, and not clicking on the links. It, I think those schools, they're pretty, pretty keen to actually go to the next step, those students, aren't very they? Yeah. Extremely, yeah. 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 Yes. I was interested in the, the platform and the project and public service that um, we in fact take on the ISS launch. Yes. Uh, continue to, is that something you can change? Yes. Uh, and, so and, you can and change the, the three metrics. You yeah. can name them whatever you want. Yeah. And then for each question, you determine what the impact is. Yeah. I actually determine the impact, so I thought that based on what you might answer, the graph would just go up and down and look good, really. Mm. <laughs> that was all. But uh, the impact can be, can be changed for each question. Yeah. yeah. There's about 40, there's about close to 45 to 50 scenarios. Any one of those can have a crisis simulation module added to it. There's only about five or six out of the box simulations, but it's very easy to just create your own extension for any of the scenarios. So the scenarios are based on attacks like ransomware, dragonfly, golden ticket, you know, killer trojan. Yes, yeah, yeah. So all of that is, anything you saw there other than the Palo Alto, Splunk, you know, actual scenario and the attack situation, that's, that's pretty fixed unless you've got a on-prem version. But the scenario, the crisis scenario is completely configurable, everything you see. Gavin, can you flip back to that screen and put it on the screen just so everyone yeah, can see? Because sure. from my perspective, that's one of the powerful things about the Cyberbit platform is it's not a bounce the ball Might kind need to of go back to follow, follow the thing through yeah, here, in a linear this fashion. This screen you mean? Yeah, that one there. Yeah, because yeah. you can see that as the decisions were made and the group would make the decisions and then from the poll we put in what everyone said and that graph is going to change and you're going to have different impacts in this case on business continuity, reputation and data integrity. And you could see early we were making very much um, business continuity type decisions and you can see that stayed very high. So the nice thing about this platform is as people provide the feedback, you get a real response on this on this uh, dashboard. So it's not, as I said, it's not linear, it's dependent on the responses and you feed into the system. At the end of the exercise, you get a debrief that combines the SOC team's response with the escalations as well as the business metrics as well. So it's all in one screen. Yeah, we're just wondering whether this platform is um, does it require some integration with your backend systems no. or it's just no. all in the cloud? Yeah, yeah. And everything's on demand. R really great question. And that's that's one of the advantages of the Cyberbit platform. The tech team can undertake their exercises, exposure to all of the uh, enterprise software that may be available and the C-suite can do a similar thing. So good question. Not for this because it's really up to your interpretation uh, and, and it's got to be discussed. So. Uh, there is no win and lose, although really if the business metrics go down, you've effectively lost. But the idea of this is that you then review, you look at your graph, you look at the answers, you get a complete debrief and you say, okay, 
what could we have done differently? Um, what well, did we set up a metrics? Hopefully they're set up correctly because it needs someone who understands the crisis at, at the discussion to actually do that. But if it's set up correctly, what did we do wrong and what can we do better? But there's no right or wrong in this. It's better or worse, really. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do we have options for the tooling? You've demonstrated Palo Alto, Carbon Black, yeah. Splunk. Is there options to change that to say in, Portinet? In relation to the firewall and the seam, yes. Yeah. Now, there's, there's three choices in most scenarios. Uh, we've only just got this year the license to use Fortinet. They were a bit difficult, but we were adding that this year. Um, but at this stage, you've got a choice of firewall and seam between about three choices. Yeah. But across the CyberBit platform, there is a huge number of different enterprise software elements that you can interact with and use. Not so much necessarily the crisis simulation, but the other parts of the system you certainly can. Very few you couldn't actually use on the system. Any other questions? I know we're getting towards the end of time. Feel free to ask any type of question. Yeah. Oh, three. System related three or? Okay. Oh, we had longer than 35. Hmm. Cool. Any other questions? Subscription based or uh, usage yeah. based? Pricing? Subscription based mostly, yeah. We do have a training. For the crisis simulation, it's a little bit different. Uh, people do purchase days of crisis simulations because consulting firms often want to present that to their com to their customers. So they'll purchase a number of days. So there is that possibility. But for people wanting to train their SOC team, it's generally done as a as an annual license subscription model. Number of number of users. Yeah. So Cyber Pathways being the Australian distributor, if you get in touch with us, we'll look at that scenario and then we work with Cyberbit to come up with a pricing model. And it might be a user based uh, model or it might be something different. So we have the ability to look at what your needs are and come up with a pricing model that suits what you want to do. So, yeah. We're pretty flexible with those, with the pricing models and the, the licensing options because it's, uh, the licenses are all managed by a customer success manager. It's not automatically done. So that gives, us flex that gives you the flexibility to tailor. Any questions? Yeah. Any more? Last call for questions. We've been talking to a lot of insurance companies um, and they're, they're interested in the platform. I can't say officially if they buy into it, but I know they're certainly interested in the platform uh, at, for, this, for that reason, that for, for providing compliance. Um, we are ISC squared certified, you know, we are ISC squared submitter. You can get uh, CP credits, you can get EC council uh, credits as well. I actually have so two I, other answers I would, for that. I would imagine that yes, definitely. Yeah. To answer that question I've got is yes, because insurance companies now you'll see their clauses that you participate in regular continuous uh, cybersecurity training. So if you did this, you could point to that activity. And the second one is the fact that um, a lot of this type of a lot of this type of training from an insurance perspective means that you're upskilling your organisation and that's often recognised as well. So, sure, and I think I've seen recent reg legislation that's actually using the term cyber war games, saying that organisations must participate in cyber war games. I read an article about it last week, which you could point to again the cyber range saying that's exactly what we're doing here. Thanks, great question. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks okay. very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you.